Even if you're not a mathematician, you've probably heard big names like category theory, set theory, number theory. But have you heard about model theory? And do you know what it is? Well, let me tell you, it's great, and it's really powerful. I'd like to introduce you to model theory and its most important tool, compactness. I am Black Zapat, and this is the true power of model theory. Model theory is a branch of first-order logic. This is not helpful, because first of all, isn't this true for all mathematics? And why first order? Does it mean there is a second order somewhere? Well, yes, I guess the same way physics can be called a branch of mathematics, but also no, because you can do a lot of things in physics that you cannot do in mathematics, like measures and experiments. The same way, in general mathematics, you can use logic to do your proof, but logic, logical statement, logical proofs are part of model theory. They are, to some extent, the object of study. And yes, there is such a thing as a second order logic, but keep that for later, now we have to focus on first order logic. And anyone having taken a class on first order logic will know that this video is too short to define it properly, so we're not going to. You don't want to have to swallow all these definitions. So in short, to do logic, we need to write formulas, and we are allowed to use logical symbols, which are the equal sign, parenthesis, this symbol meaning and, this symbol meaning or, this symbol meaning not, and this symbol meaning implies. With these logical symbols, you can write statements such as A implies B, not B and A, etc. And you can also use variables, sometimes written V1, V2, etc. But I'd rather use letters like XYZ. And you also have quantifiers to put in front of your variables. And finally, you have symbols coming from a language that can change depending on what you want to express. You can have constant symbols such as 1 or 0, function symbols such as plus, times, exponential, and relation symbols such as being smaller, being divisible by, or any other stuff. Okay, now write a formula. Right, well, I didn't specify the rules, but I think we can pretty much all agree that this is not a formula. This, however, is a formula, and so is this. Really, if it makes sense, it's a formula. If it doesn't, it's garbage. Now, we can take a bunch of axioms, put them together, and call it a theory. Then we can take a set and equip it with interpretation for the language and call that a structure. And if we have a structure for which all axioms in the theory are true, we call it a model, and rewrite it with this funny little symbol. Okay, now I know what you're gonna say. You didn't define what axioms are. Well, okay, let me do it. An action is a formula in which every variable is quantified. Okay, but what about the interpretation in a set of symbols of the language? Well, it just means for constant symbols you have a corresponding element in your structure, and for function symbols you have a function, etc. It's very natural, really. But what about truth? What does it even mean for a bunch of symbols to be true in an abstract mathematical object? Well, this is also quite intuitive. Like, the formula, there exists x such that x squared equal minus 1, is true when there exists x such that x squared equal minus 1. You know, it's just what it's supposed to be, we don't have time. And I didn't even say what first order means. So, in short, it means you can quantify only over elements. So this means there is an element x in m such that something like that. Second order means, in some sense, you can quantify over subsets. So, for example, all subgroups of R are either dense or discrete. Is a statement in second order, but not in first order. Get it? Cool. Because now we can move on to compactness. Compactness is the final smash of model theory, and it's the main reason why we only do first order, really, because in second order it doesn't really work. It says, a first order theory is consistent, if and only if it is finitely consistent. Okay, so you take a finite number of formulas from T. You prove they are consistent by finding or more often constructing a model of all these formulas at once, and provided you can do that for any finite collections of formula, well, compactness guarantees a model of the full theory. That's nice, isn't it? You don't need to check that the whole theory is consistent, you just have to prove that any finite sub-theory is consistent. Well, okay, let me tell you, this is much more powerful than it looks. Let me give you an example. First, we need to specify the language. The language has three constants. 0, 1, and c. It has three functions, plus, minus, and times, and it has a relation symbol. Consider the following formula, phi n, which states that n is smaller than c. 
Okay, so n is not technically a symbol of our language, but when I say n, I actually means 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times, which is something you can write in first order with the symbols of this language. Now, for any n, there is a model of the theory of R, that is, the list of all formulas true in R, and phi n. Just take R and interpret the symbol C as n plus 1. Now, because of compactness, we are guaranteed that there is a model r star of the theory of r and all phi n's for all n. Well then, in this model, c must be bigger than any integer, and 1 over c is infinitesimal, that is, it is bigger than 0 but smaller than any real number. Nonetheless, despite the existence of such weird elements, this model satisfies the same axioms as r, such as any positive element has a square root, or minus 1 has no square root, or any degree 3 polynomial has root. This is what we call a hyperreal field. Once you have infinitesimals, a lot of things become so easy to state, like continuity. A hyperreal function is continuous if and only if infinitesimal variation of x results in infinitesimal variations of f of x. How clean is that? There is no epsilon and delta getting arbitrarily small, just take infinitesimals. Much easier, much cleaner, and may I say, this is how Leibniz himself talked about continuity, with infinitesimals. But model theory had not been invented yet, and Leibniz couldn't make rigorous the idea of infinitesimal variations. So Weierstrass, among others, came up with this epsilon delta notation to make it more rigorous. The epsilon delta statement of limits and continuity and derivability is equivalent to this kind of statement with infinitesimals. And I find them much cleaner and much more intuitive. So thanks to Robinson and other model theorists of the 20th century, we have a new way to talk about continuity, and this is called non-standard analysis, and you can look more into it, there is some link in the description. And just to reassure you, you can go from a real function to a hyper-real function quite easily by doing compactness, and since continuity, derivability, limits, etc. are all first order, anything you can prove in a hyperreal field is also true in R. All the suffering you went through when learning limits, Cauchy sequences, derivations, could have been avoided had we known earlier about compactness. Hey, quick question. Is this function subjective? Okay, well, let's see. I'm taking three coordinates in C, and I want to find a common root for three polynomials. Hmm. Can you do it? Because I sure can't. We'll try to find another way. Let's have a butcher at finite fields. The simplest ones are fp, which are just the integers modulo p. But there are many others, so let's try to study them. First of all, any finite field must roll back. If you add one to itself enough times, you must roll back, because you cannot take infinitely many values, because you are finite. So at some point they will be equal, and then by subtracting one side to the other, you can say that adding one to itself will result to zero at some point. And you can convince yourself that this must happen for a prime number p. Which means that in any finite field, there is a p such that p equals zero. Which means that a finite field must contain fp. Actually, it means that it must contain p to the n elements. And with a bit of algebra, you can convince yourself, but it's much harder than there is a unique field of size p to the n, for each n, and for each p. p is called the characteristic of the field, and again, it is the prime number such that p equals zero. Now, if you take the union of all finite fields of characteristic p, you obtain an algebraically closed field of characteristic p. It means any polynomial in fp bar has a root, and p equals zero. This field, fp bar, has many interesting properties, but we'll focus on one of them. If a function from fp bar to the n to itself is polynomial, meaning each coordinate is a polynomial on n variables, and also injective, then it is surjective. And we'll prove it. First of all, f has coefficients in fp bar, which is the union of all fpk, so actually f has coefficients in some fpk. Now, the restriction of f to fpl to the n, provided l is bigger than k, has image in fpl to the n. f is injective, by assumption, and since we restricted it to a finite set, it must be surjective. 
from fpl to the n to itself. Now, if you take any point in fp bar to the n, it must lie in some fpl to the n. So we know f will reach it at some point. Feel free to take a break and review this step of the proof for yourself. Can you see how it goes? And can you see how much of this proof relies on the fact that fp bar is a union of finite fields? This kind of proof wouldn't work for any other algebraically closed field, let alone C. But I would really like to prove it in C. Could I, for example, cheat by using something called the compactness theorem, on which I'm making a video right now, and since I'm writing the script, I guess it makes sense for me to use the compactness theorem. Mm, well, to use compactness, we first need to state the theorem in first order. Here's my language. It contains 0, 1, plus, and times. In this language, I can write a formula saying a polynomial function f on n coordinates of degree less than d and with coefficients a is injective. We just write, for all y and z, f of y equal f of z implies y equals z. Of course, f is not in my language, but polynomials can be written with plus and times. I just need coefficients, which are here put in non-quantified variables of my formula. And I specify n and d to make sure my formula is not infinitely long. If you don't really believe that I can write things like that, you can check in the description for my main source, where the formula is written more precisely. Similarly, I can talk about surjectivity with the same caveats as before. And finally, I can just write injective implies surjective. I'll just name this formula delta nd. And note that delta has only quantified variables, so it's an action. And I can now write a theory T consisting of ACF, which is the theory of algebraically closed fields. So it contains field axioms such as for all x, x plus 0 equal x, etc, etc. And it also contains an axiom saying that any polynomial of degree n has a root. T also contains car 0. Car 0 says the field is of characteristic 0, like q, r, or c. It means you never roll back. You never have p equals 0 for any p. So that's what car 0 contains. And finally, t contains delta, which is just all deltas nd for all values of n and d. So t is saying that any polynomial function which is injective is also surjective. We want to use compactness. We take a finite subtheory S of t and we find a model for it. Since it only contains finitely many formulas, it only says p is not zero for finitely many p. So I can find a prime not in this list, and fp bar will be a model of s. It is algebraically closed, so it checks any subtheory of ACF. It checks delta, as proven before, so it also checks any subtheory of delta. And since I chose p, which doesn't appear in the finite list of formulas presenting this subtheory, it also checks the subtheory of car zero. Therefore, for any finite subtheory S of t, I can find a model, which means t is finitely consistent, which means it is consistent by compactness and there is a model of t. Let's look a bit more at this model. Well, it's an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero on which all injective polynomial functions are surjective. But I don't really care that such a field exists, right? I wanted to study polynomial function in C, not in some weird abstractly granted to exist field. Thankfully, there is a very famous result of model theory, although famous here doesn't mean much because model theory in itself is not really famous, but very famous result says ACF0 is complete. If a first-order formula holds in some algebraically closed field of characteristic 0, then it holds in all algebraically closed field of characteristic 0. So, all these shenanigans of injective subjective functions, since it is first-order and it holds in this model M that we just found, well, it holds in C. How amazing is that? We just proved that any injective polynomial function from C to the n to itself is also surjective. And we didn't even have to do any fancy complex analysis to prove it. I think that's a very neat result. But let's go back at the original question. Is this function surjective? Well, now it's easier, right? Yes, of course it's surjective. Because it's clearly injective. I mean, I think it's easier to check injectivity than to try to find common roots of multiple polynomials, right? Let me know if you disagree, and let me know what you think of this video in general. Also, let me mention that there is another YouTube video on the subject of this theorem by Axe, also called the Axe-Grotendieck theorem. 
It's a lecture that was given virtually during the dark and ancient year of 2020, so it's not really adapted for a typical YouTube audience, but at least it's much more detailed and much more precise than what I did. You can find the link in the description, along sources and more. That's it for me, bye!